Hello entomology class, here we go again. Today we're going to talk about some really, really awesome insects called the Polyneoptera. Alright, so let's just kind of get an idea. Uh, we've covered the non-flying six-legged arthropods and then remember this is where uh, the insects evolved wings. So we've got wings at that point and then we've Paleoptera, uh, the old style of wings kind of broke off there. Now we're getting to this point and they actually call this uh, Neoptera. I should have probably written this on there. Neoptera meaning new wings. Alright, so at this point in time with the Polyneoptera, Perineoptera, and Holometabola, the wings are more complicated than they were before. Mayflies and dragonflies, you know, they can they can put their wings they can beat their wings up and down. That's about it, right? Now, with Neopter, they actually evolved the ability to fold them. So not only up and down, but they can kind of fold them over their back so they get a new plane of rotation. Not just like this, but now we can go like this. And that allows for a lot more evolutionary success, right? We talked about how many, if we come back to this point in the tree right here, well, we have a split here between the non-flying and the flying insects and, you know, just a huge advantage to flying because um, there's so many more species down here than there are up in the, the non-flying arthro or six-legged arthropods or hexapods. Then we get the evolution of flight and this group is way bigger than the other group. Now, Neoptera... You can see there, Polyneoptera, Perineoptera, spelled just like that because my handwriting terrible, uh, especially with a mouse. I'm trying to remedy that soon, hopefully. But the Polyneoptera, the Neoptera in general, all these insects with the ability to fold their fold their wings over their back just exploded in diversity. There's a lot of mayflies and a lot of dragonflies, yes, but there is thousands time th thousands and thousands of times the number of those insects found in the polyneoptera perineoptera and whole metabola especially in the whole metabola each time we get this new really cool evolutionary advantage you see this kind of explosion so so here we have neoptera here and the explosion is going to happen with that group so kind of to zoom in here now Right now we're talking this group right here, the Polyneoptera, and they form what we call a monophyletic clade, meaning just a one big group by themselves uh, that includes everything from this point and nothing else. All right, and so we're going to cover all these orders today in this in this lecture here, and we'll start just kind of at the top. We're going to start right here, uh, the mantids. Bladids and Isoptera, we call that the Dictyoptera, okay? Dictyoptera, uh, uh, the Latin uh, dictuon means net, and obviously teron means wing. So they call these things the net wing things, and I'm looking at the images I put up here for that, and that's pretty poor choice of images. Uh, you can kind of see it with the cockroach here, a very net like wing that it looks like kind of leathery uh kind of looks like a leathery net mantids have that as well but this is an immature mantid and termites have that as well but this is a worker that does not have wings only the winged reproductives have that uh, which we'll we'll get into so here are the the dictyoptera uh the first one is the mantoidea uh, mantis meaning prophet, edos meaning type. So uh, the prophet type, I guess, because they kind of look like they're saying a prayer a lot when they hold their wings, or excuse me, not their wings, but their four limbs out uh, in front of them. That's how you kind of get their name. They're very awesome, powerful predators. They're just so cool. Hugely diverse group, 2,000 species, and just tons of cool different types. You can see here, with this great big extension of the pronotum on its back on this one as well as 
its wings kind of look just like a leaf. Uh, this one's going to be hanging out in the leaves and in the flowers. This is the orchid mantid that's just waiting to uh, dive down and kill um, anything that kind of comes over to the orchid. Um, those are some of the coolest ones around, hands down. So some of the key characters, the really important things with these are the raptorial front legs. Those front legs, uh, you can see on this one pretty well, these just spikes. Uh, they're used for just grasping down on the prey so they can just grab it. And you can see here, grabbed a little insect and it just starts eating it. I'm gonna rip it apart and eat it quick. They have a really long and large prothorax. So that's right here. No wings on the prothorax, remember? The first set of legs extends off there. They have an enlarged and long prothorax. That is head that can just move around 180 degrees. It can look behind itself. Uh, if you ever catch one of these, keep it for a little while. And it's really cool. You can, you can guide your finger around it. The, it'll follow you. Um, really, really cool stuff that they can do. And they can see behind their backs without turning around. Uh, their heads are usually triangular shaped. Um, they do have this history of females eating males uh, during the copulation process. That is not an old wives' tale or myth. That is actually true. That does happen, uh, which is pretty cool. They're very, very big predators. Sometimes you find their egg case attached to a building or a wall or something like that. They're a good thing to have in a garden They because they eat so many bugs. Um, they won't all stay there, of course, but uh, if you find one of those, put in your garden because they're great. All right, now we get to the order Blatteria. Now, uh, Blatteria is now used for cockroaches and termites. We found out uh, a little while back, in fact, I was in the lab that kind of did the molecular work that figured this out. I was on a polyneoptera project, actually, and I... I don't get enough credit for that, to be honest. Um, we figured out that termites are, in fact, part of the cockroaches. So some there's the, the wood roaches that start living in wood. The termites probably evolved right from the wood roaches a long time ago, but still. So now we kind of use the term uh, blatteria. Well, uh, some people use blatteria, some people use blatodia. It's... Um, it's it's just don't worry about it. We're gonna kind of we're gonna kind of separate out Blatteria, Blatodia, uh, the cockroaches and the termites. We'll call Isoptera. That's kind of the classic term for termites. And termites are so important and cool, even though they're not technically their own um, order. They're pretty cool. For the cockroaches, we have close to five thousand species. There are only four that are really, really serious pests. Uh, Player Planeta Americana is the, the cockroach you find in you know, every house in the south, every building. Um, nasty, nasty critters. The Oriental Roach, the German Roach. Uh, those aren't that great, but there's tons of other really, really great roaches that are beautiful, that are important. Um, so more about the roaches, they're, they're very flattened. They're always very flat and they can crawl into and under spaces. They usually have cerci. They're omnivorous and they have eggs encased in oothica. Um, you've maybe seen a mantid uh, egg case. Uh, a roach one is kind of the same. Looks a lot the same. They're really, really important sources of uh, food for lots of animals. Really important in the food chain. Like I said, there's some that are just beautiful. Uh, gorgeous organisms. People just don't like them. Uh, they get a really bad name, and justifiably so, but they're actually really, really important. Um, they they also do a lot of nutrient re recycling and things like that. I'm going to kind of try and speed this up a little bit. As we kind of keep on going down Dictyoptera, we have the Isoptera. Again, controversial. Is it its own thing, not its own thing? But we're not going to worry too much about that. There's about 2,600 species. They are social. They're truly social. After we get through all the orders, we're going to have a lecture or, or a lesson on sociality. So I'm going to hold off on that um, for now. Um, they're the only hemimetabolous social insect. So the other truly social insects are the bees, 
some bees, some wasps, and ants um, are you know what these look like? They're medium to small size. They have these um, antenna. That are they're very different from ant antennae. Uh, ant antennae usually have an elbow in there. These kind of um have uh they're just more straight and short. Uh, the little bulbs that eat cellulose or cellulose. Uh, that's really important. They're really important pests of wood. They're really really important for breaking down wood that falls in a forest but they're also really bad and that they will eat um, your house that's not good the way that they break down cellulose cellulose is not an easy thing we're also gonna have a little bit of a, a little lesson on symbiosis so we're not gonna get too deep here but in their gut they host a number of um, protozoans and symbiotic bacteria that are used to break down cellulose so they can eat something like wood. Wood is not, there's nothing really healthy or redeemable about trying to eat wood if you because we would never be able to break it down. Um, but a termite does really well because it has health. Now those are gut parasites. They're not, or not parasites, excuse me, gut symbionts. They're not intracellular symbionts so they have to be transferred and they get transferred via trophallaxis trophallaxis is when and this is gross but here you go when one uh, termite vomits into the mouth of another termite that's called trophallaxis and they do that so they can get all those gut uh, symbionts to survive on and they make some not all a lot live just in trees uh, or have underground mounds but they make these amazing termite mounds uh, I recently got to go to Africa and the landscape was just covered with these impressive huge really cool termite mounds they were a little bit different than the ones you see pictured here um, bigger in some cases just massive and you should watch this little video I actually put it here and I put it in the lesson for um, for, for social insects. Uh, watch it one of the two places, but it kind of describes and goes through the importance of these things. They, they allow for air cycling and air conditioning and heating and just keeping the, the colony at the perfect temperature all the time. Uh, but I'm not gonna do a lot more on the socialness of these. Uh, we'll save that for the next lecture. Our next little group are the Zoraptora. These are small, soft-bodied insects. There's not really much you need to know about them. North America, there's only uh, one family and two species. There's only about 30 species known worldwide. They look a lot like termites. They're not termites, um, although they do. you do find them in piles of rotting wood and aged sawdust. Uh, they're, they're, they're not common. Um, you'll rarely come across them. They're cool little critters. All right, so now we've got Zoraptora and all the Dictyoptera. Now we're going to kind of head down to these three and then finish off with these last four. So Dermaptera, Plecoptera, and Orthoptera are three fairly important groups. The Dermaptera are the earwigs. You've probably heard the term earwigs. Uh, the, the, the name Dermaptera, uh, derma meaning skin and terra meaning wings, they have these little coverings over their wings uh, that are, well, I'll show you kind of in the next slide. You can see it a little bit better. Um, really hard and leathery, so that's kind of where they get their name, skin wings. Uh, so that's the thick and four wings that cover the protected skin. Uh, they have these cerci, these like forceps in the back. And when I was a kid, I was terrified of these things. Most kids are. They're really more for mating they don't do a lot they're, they never do anything to you you know they do try and pinch you with them from time to time but uh, they don't get very far with a human um, they feed on a lot of uh, detritus dead decaying uh, vegetable and animal matter dead animals themselves uh, they have chewing mouth parts they do not crawl into people's ears i guess when i was a kid i was always told they get into the wig and then they crawl into the ear um, and that is not accurate. 
Another cool thing about the Dermaptera is that they have maternal care. Uh, they tend to their eggs. Uh, they also feed and tend to newly hatched nymphs. It's not terribly common amongst the insects, so Dermaptera are pretty cool in that regard. Um, this importance, uh, we kind of already covered most of that. All right, the Plecoptera. Pleco meaning folded, terra meaning wings, of course. They have folded wings, a lot of things do, but you see they have four membranous wings folded nicely right over their back like this. These are aquatic uh, as immatures. You can see here is an aquatic uh, immature or nymph right here. They live typically in fast flowing streams. They need a lot of oxygen. They prefer cooler temperature water. They're predaceous um, to a degree underwater. Uh, some of them are at least. So then they hatch out. Usually you only find them uh, near streams. They hatch out and mate and don't live terribly long. They do live longer than mayflies, but they don't do a lot. They don't uh, eat a lot after they hatch out. Um, but they're kind of cool, really cool to look at. They are very, very important in the um, in biomonitoring. So, like I said in the last one, they, they prefer clean, well oxygenated water to survive. So if water gets polluted, then that becomes a problem for stoneflies. So if you find water that's polluted pretty bad, then um, usually that means the stoneflies are dead. Uh, my undergraduate uh, professor, he, has, he was an expert on stoneflies, and he told a really cool story. Let's see if I can kind of tell it here. He said there was a plant uh, that was around a river. So here was uh, the manufacturing plant, and they were a major polluter. And they would dump stuff into the river here. The river kind of flowed this direction. And they would dump stuff in the river here. And he was hired kind of as a consultant to uh, monitor the water and see if it was killing the insects. And so he would go, you know, and he would survey the insect populations all along here with Plecoptera, but also with Trichoptera, which we'll talk about, and Ephemeroptera. Those are the big three. And what he found was right about here, there was like a major die-off, and there was no insects for a big part of the, of the river. He's like, well, what the heck's going on there? And what he found was that they had a secret tube going underground and coming up underwater. They was dumping the worst of their crap in there. Um, terrible, terrible pollution. Now this was back in like the 80s and 90s too. You get away with a lot more. Now you'd be in so much freaking trouble. They did get in a lot of trouble. Uh, EPA fined them up the wazoo and they had to clean up their practices, but they were pretty dirty, you know, metaphorically and um, literally. Dumping crap here, dumping crap, you know, they would Sorry, they're dumping crap over here, dumping crap over here, but the secret place here was the worst. And it was biomonitoring using things like these stoneflies that uh, allowed him to figure that out. So the stonefly life cycle, female is going to lay some eggs. Those eggs will float down to the bottom, hopefully not get eaten by trout. Um, the stoneflies will then grow and grow for a long time, can be upwards of a couple of years uh, underwater. They get under the stones. You can find them in a nice, flat, fast-flowing stream underwater. Then when they're ready to hatch out, they crawl up. They climb out of their exuvia with wings. They mate, and then the female drops eggs back in and starts the whole cycle all over again. It's kind of similar to mayflies, um, different group. Really cool stuff. Orthoptera are a very important group. Um, hugely important because there's, there's so many of them, and there's so many problems with them really uh, so orthos uh, just like orthodontist and things is straight uh, terra meaning wings so they have the straight winged things because the first grasshoppers they found had these nice straight wings and then they started looking at other things like oh wait crickets are grasshoppers they don't really have the same straight wings often they don't have wings some have these small stunted wings katie did i don't know if you'd call that straight wing really so it's probably a bad name um but they are all over the place. They're everywhere. Really easy to find and collect. They're mostly phytophagous, meaning they're eating plant material. 
there are some that are predaceous and some that are scavengers. This is a mole cricket down here. Uh, they dig deep down in um, and eat more, um, not so much live plant material, but um, deep down into burrows and they eat a bunch of um, detritus and crap, you know, kind of digging down in their, in their um, underground. So they have modified legs for jumping. Uh, within a large femur, you can see here, right? Saltatorial legs for jumping. The front wings are thickened. Uh, the tegmina, right? So they have this, uh, also called the tegmin sometimes. Um, Hemometabolous development, but of course we know that because everything right now is hemometabolous. Everything in the polyneoptera. Uh, they make a lot of sounds, and the sounds are really cool. And so to make sounds, you have to have a really good ear. And so they have an ear. Ears in a weird place, not on the head, uh, on the thorax, or sometimes on the actual leg, uh, the base of the front tibia, katydids and crickets, right? Or first abdominal segment, and it's other grasshoppers. Um, so they have a tympanic membrane, kind of like, um, kind of similar to our eardrum, and then they have stuff behind that that senses the vibrations on that membrane and then shoots that signal um, up the sensory body and so they can pick up on the signal and they communicate a ton this way uh, going back and forth constantly uh, helping males find females and back and, and vice versa uh, they do it through stridulation they don't call out their name but they uh, will rub uh, one body part against another if you'll see with um with crickets they'll stridulate across their back with their little kind of pathetic wings that don't really work some will rub their legs against their abdomen uh, to make these sounds um, there's lots of them they're really cool uh, on the little lesson there's three videos the grasshopper katydid and snowy tree cricket uh, that you can listen to kind of the sounds that they make they also create a problem. They make they, they do a lot of swarming, especially uh, Africa, Australia, and other places like that. I'm going to talk about swarms more later. But they when they hatch out, they hatch out all at once, and they can be really really bad, um, causing a lot of damage, huge amounts of damage. They'll just come out and they'll eat everything to the ground. But I'm going to like I said, I'm going to save that for a little later. All right. So now we've actually made it through the whole top. Bit. Now we just have these last four little groups, uh, which are important but not crook important, so we should be able to get through them fairly fast. The Gorilla Blatoidea, uh, another uh, another one of our bad names, uh, got its name Gorilla from Gorilla Day, which is crickets and Blatoidea, which are roaches, because people thought, oh, these are kind of like crickets and roaches, but they are not uh, that. Um, Yeah, I forget, I can't go back. They look like that, but they're not cockroaches and they're not crickets. So they're poorly named. They're known as ice bugs or rock crawlers. They live on glaciers, North America, Japan, and Russia. And basically, I don't know if you ever noticed, hopefully you have, in the winter when you see snow melting, um, snow melts and it turns brown and more and more brown because all the crap that's in there comes to the surface as the snow is melting into smaller and smaller piles. So these things cruise around on glaciers and they eat all that crap that uh, surfaces all the detritus and stuff as as glaciers melt essentially so they only come out in the summertime but they still really like things cold in fact if you hold one in your hand it's going to die because it can't handle heat like that when you're used to cruising around in the, in the snow all the time don't do a lot with heat their closest relative are the Mantophasmatoidea. These are really cool. These are known as gladiators or heel walkers. They're another really bad name. They were actually just discovered in the late 90s. Uh, the most recent order that we have found by a long shot. Um, they were found in Namibia. They're now known from Namibia, Tanzania, and parts of South Africa, which means they're probably in Botswana, uh, probably in uh, a few other countries maybe Zimbabwe down there. Uh, we don't know for sure. I've not been found down there, 
Um, they do like the desert quite a bit. Um, but they thought these looked like mantids and walking sticks, and they are not mantids or walking sticks. They're not close related to either. They're most close related to the ice bugs that we're just looking at. So kind of one, one group went full cold north, one group went full desert south. Um, and it's kind of cool when they found these things and realized they were a new order. Then they looked at a lot of old museums and actually found some different um, specimens that had been collected and stuck in with the walking sticks. Um, but anyway, the body is cylindrical and wingless. Mouth hearts are mandibulate, meaning they have mandibles for chewing. They've got short little Cersei. Um, I already talked about where they are. They're nocturnal predators. Really cool. Gladiators. Um, cool critters. All right, next are the Embiopterae, which are the web spinners. There's not very many of these, only about 200 uh, worldwide, but they spin these really intricate, cool webs, and they live underneath them as a form of protection. They actually, the webs are actually waterproof as well. Uh, so they make these really intricate tunnels and things that they go through. They shoot webs, they spin webs actually out of their wrists, not out of their uh, end of their abdomen like a spider does. So there's some thought that, uh, I've been told this, but it's probably just entomologists trying to justify our existence and sound cooler than we really are. But that Spider-Man uh, having webs come out of his wrist was really um, inspired by the MB Opter, by the web spinners. You can see they kind of have these big and large uh, big and large forelegs, uh, and that's for spinning those webs. They have silk glands in there. Okay, lastly are the Phasmatoidea. Uh, phasma being an apparition, phantom, or ghost. These are the stick insects, and they're named that way because they are hard to find, really hard to see. I remember collecting some of these in Thailand years ago. Uh, I walked up to a big pile of sticks on the ground, uh, some workers had actually kind of put them all together there, and I thought, oh, there's probably something cool under here. And I took my net, and I pulled up, and I kind of stuck it under there and pulled the, the sticks up, looking around for beetles or anything. Didn't see anything, and I kind of moved my, I moved out my uh, net and just was suddenly looking, and all of a sudden I was looking at the pile, and I'm like, pile's still moving. How's it still moving? And I realized there was about three or four stick insects in that little pile. And these little, really, really thin ones, they're good at mimicking a stick in the wind. So when they get disturbed, they kind of like shake, or they kind of sway back and forth, and that's what these uh, insects were doing. It was really kind of cool. Um, they're all herbivorous. Some are parthenogenetic, meaning they can reproduce without mating, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, a lot have reduced or absent wings, also really cool. They can uh, emit a, a nasty substance if they get disturbed as part of their protection because uh, you, your protection there is camouflage to hide or to have this smell come out. Um, their size, uh, they can be up to 12 inches long just in their body and they can be actually up to 30 inches long. Uh, can't even see this in the camera, but they can be about 30 inches long with their legs stretched out all the way. Okay, just pause it so I could go get my insect collection, or part of it anyway. You can see right here, here is a giant stick insect from Thailand, um, a different place than I was clicking that other time. You see how big that thing is. So the longest insects in the world are some of these giant stick insects. Um, from a few different places. So they're really cool. All right. Um, the importance of these, they can lower the growth of some plants through consumption and through defecation. This guy here uh, is my old undergraduate advisor. They were collecting these things like crazy in New Guinea. And these things would, uh, there were so many of them up in the trees, and they would, um, reproduce so vigorously that so you'd walk around through the forest and you could hear it sounded like rain and it wouldn't be raining and they realized after a couple days there that 
it was stick insects laying eggs and they're just dropping eggs out of the forest um, to land on the ground where they'll kind of just hang out and hopefully someone will hatch out and and make new sticks uh, eventually all right that's it for the polyneoptera hope you enjoyed it uh, learn some of those key characters all the different orders we covered and get ready for your exam